So now that I've lived through a uh, false alarm, I know in my gut that this danger is not going to go away. The risk of some kind of accidental nuclear war due to a false alarm or due to a blunder or a miscalculation or a mistake in the heated moment of conflict, that it's not going to go away until we eliminate nuclear weapons. That's the voice of Cynthia Lazaroff, award-winning documentary filmmaker and founder of Nuclear Wake Up Call Earth and Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. We have two anniversaries this week. Ten years ago, we witnessed the nuclear accident at the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan following a massive tsunami. And we also mark the first full year of the global pandemic. Michelle, I hear you. Japan is mourning the victims of the earthquake and tsunami that caused the nuclear disaster. This was the most severe nuclear accident since the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. Uh, nearly half a million people were displaced because of it, and the environmental legacy will be with us for decades. But on a brighter note, we seem to be inching closer to a post-pandemic world, and we have a great show for you today. Michelle, who is joining us on Early Warning? Today, Mary Kaczynski, Director of Government Relations at Vote Vets, and Gayatri Patel, Director of Gender Advocacy at Care USA, hop on to early warning. We talk about the growing pressure for the U.S. and Iran to re enter the nuclear agreement. There has been little progress these past weeks, despite expressed interest from both sides. We also discuss the upcoming address by Vice President Harris in front of the U.N. Commission on Women and prospects for advancing gender equity. After that, I talked to Cynthia Lazaroff to discuss the 2018 Hawaii false missile alert. Cynthia was on the island of Kauai on the day of the false alarm, and she tells of her harrowing firsthand experience, the importance of nuclear risk reduction, something Cynthia has been working on for decades through track two diplomacy with Russia. And we also talk about Cynthia's work to foster a new generation of women leaders, so please tune in. And in our final segment, Tom answers a question about the recent solar winds hack on this week's Q&A. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. With that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now... Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today I'm joined by Mary Kaczynski, Director of Government Relations at Vote Vets, and Gayatri Patel, Director of Gender Advocacy at Care USA. Thank you both for joining. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. This is great. So as you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Mary, despite promising statements from U.S. and Iranian officials about interest in resuming diplomacy, we have not yet seen a plan for how the U.S. and Iran come back into compliance with the JCPOA. Why do you think we haven't really seen renewed talks yet? So this basically gets down to domestic politics on both the U.S. and the Iranian side. Had the Biden administration taken some good faith steps early, such as providing some much needed humanitarian relief to Iran, this could have been avoided. But the Biden administration didn't do that. So that empowered hardliners in Iran who have been pressuring moderates within Iran to sort of roll back some of these nuclear violations or come back into compliance, you know, once we had the Biden administration in place. So Iranian hardliners were then empowered and became entrenched in and doubled down on their violations of the nuclear deal. Then on the U.S. side, hawkish voices who have always opposed any kind of diplomacy with Iran became empowered as well. So they sort of reacted to the increased steps that Iran took to breach the nuclear deal. So we've all kind of devolved into a stalemate with the domestic politics on both sides, keeping those hardline voices 
lifted up and preventing moderate voices or pro-diplomacy voices on both sides from de-escalating and taking the steps that are needed on both sides to come back into compliance. There's been a lot of talk about timelines between the three-month temporary agreement recently negotiated by the International Atomic Energy Agency and the upcoming Iranian elections in June. And it feels like there is pressure to figure out how the U.S. can reenter the deal, how to bring Iran back into compliance. How should the U.S. be approaching this moment? So this really is crunch time. Former Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz has recently estimated that There are about 10 weeks remaining before we approach a real nuclear crisis, 10 weeks for both the U.S. and Iran to take some serious steps to come back into compliance. Again, I think this really gets back to one side has to move first or they have to meet to carefully coordinate those first steps. So, you know, neither side will be giving concessions that could hurt them really badly back home, given, again, these domestic politics. You know, and a lot of possibilities that have been discussed, again, come back to those humanitarian gestures the Biden administration could make, right? So, for example, lifting the block on the IMF loan or unfreezing some assets, Iran's own money, right? Giving them access to some of that kind of capital. And again, any kind of humanitarian gesture, you know, carve outs from some of the Trump sanctions. Those are things that the Biden administration could do that are on a completely separate track from nuclear concessions, that could really move the process forward and improve prospects for diplomacy. Thanks, Mary. Gayatri, looking in a different direction, this week, Vice President Kamala Harris will speak at the UN Commission on the Status of Women, marking the first major opportunity for the Biden-Harris administration to engage on gender issues on the global stage. What will you be watching for? Thanks, Michelle. I mean, to to start off, it's a really exciting moment to have the first female vice president, the first woman of color in such a senior level position representing the United States on the world stage on gender equality. I think it's really going to signal to the world that, you know, representation matters. Diversity is a a strong commitment from the Biden administration. And so I I think those are the kinds of themes that we're going to see throughout CSW. We're going to see the U.S. government taking strong positions when it comes to intersectionality and how gender gender equality kind of intersects with issues of race and ethnicity and uh, ability, et cetera. We're likely going to be looking for thoughts around gender as a broader term so that we can really you know, be building policy that's inclusive of trans women and really focus on non-discrimination against gender, non-binary individuals, et cetera. And I think we're also going to see from the U.S. government a strong focus on COVID and COVID response and just really highlighting how the secondary impacts of the pandemic have really disproportionately affected women and girls when it comes to things like gender-based violence and economic participation. So I think those are the things that we'll see from the U.S. government as they're represented at CSW. Now, looking in the United States, the House in Congress has reintroduced the feminist foreign policy resolution with 36 co-sponsors. And as we discussed in last week's episode, the resolution calls for the adoption of a feminist foreign policy ranging from topics from foreign assistance to trade and defense and cites a need for funding and oversight mechanisms. What other actions related to gender equity and feminist foreign policy do you hope to see Congress take over the coming months? Well, I think first and foremost, we're going to see discussions about resources. And, you know, with the president's budget coming up, we really want to see a strong budget request from the president and similarly, a a strong, robust appropriation from, from Congress for integration of gender equality across the United States foreign assistance programs. I think that's going to be a really critical next step, particularly with the announcement of the White House Gender Policy Council it's going to be really incredibly important for Congress and the administration to resource those efforts and make sure that the mandate that this gender policy council has been given can actually be achieved. So I I think that's going to be high on on our list. But I think we're also going to see movement on a, a number of different issues, movement through legislation to preserve women's reproductive choice with a, a number of, of bills that are out there to, to do exactly that. Um, legislation to uphold the equal rights of the LGBT community, including bills like the Equality Act and the Globe Act. I think in line with the president's priority around gender-based violence, we're going to see legislation and congressional action on GBV, 
Um, I'm thinking, you know, domestically, the Violence Against Women Act, but also internationally, we have legislation like the International Violence Against Women Act or the Safe from the Start Act, which talks about GBV and emergencies. I think we'll see a lot of action there, but really hoping to also get really strong response on COVID. And I know that that's, that's been part of the discussions the past few weeks about the COVID supplemental, but really putting a finer point on some of the gendered impacts of the pandemic particularly around economic participation and gender-based violence. So there's, there are a lot of possibilities, a lot of things that the advocacy community is pushing for, um, but you know, really just want to be able to see this partnership between Congress and the administration live up to those promises or the priorities made to, to really centralize gender equality and to look at it you know, from an intersectional lens the way it was promised. Well, with that, our seven minutes are up. Thank you both for joining. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the Managing Director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate, If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation. Or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. January 13th, 2018 started out like any other Saturday in Hawaii with a beautiful sunrise. But at 8.07 a.m., the day took a dramatic turn. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency broadcast an official message to more than 1 million people. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. This was just days after North Korea's Kim Jong-un said his nuclear launch button was, quote, always on my table. And President Trump tweeted that his button was, quote, much bigger and more powerful. So a no-warning nuclear attack from North Korea seemed plausible. Hawaiians panicked and ran through the streets in terror and confusion. Parents opened manhole covers and pushed their crying children down into the sewers for protection. People with relatives in different locations struggled to decide who to go to first. And in stores, customers lay down on the floors beside strangers. Terrified drivers sped at 90 miles an hour, racing to find shelter or loved ones. How long until the missiles arrive? Where will they land? Are they carrying nuclear warheads? No one knew. No one was prepared for this. Terrified Hawaiians waited 38 long minutes for a nuclear attack that never came. It was a false alarm. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency employee who believed that the missile threat was real pushed the wrong button. And the agency didn't have the safeguards in place to prevent this all-too-human error. Cynthia Lazaroff was on the island of Kauai that day. And she is here today to tell us about her harrowing experience and how it motivated her to help others learn from it. Cynthia, welcome to the show. Tom, thank you. I'm so happy and honored to be here. So, Cynthia, first, bring us back to that day three years ago. What happened? So, Tom, I want to begin by stepping back to what was going on in my life leading up to that day. And I pretty much at the end of the Cold War had stopped worrying about nuclear war. And all of that changed for me in 2017 when I was asked to work on a film interviewing 
top experts in the U.S. and Russia on U.S.-Russia relations and nuclear dangers. And I interviewed dozens of experts and pretty much everybody I interviewed awakened me to today's staggering nuclear danger. And the two people who had the greatest impact on me were former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and our U.S. former Secretary of Defense, William Perry. And Secretary Perry said to me in the interview that today we're at a greater risk of a nuclear catastrophe than at any time in history, and that most people are blissfully unaware of that danger. And then he turned to me and he said, we're sleepwalking into a nuclear catastrophe and we must wake up. For me, that was a devastating revelation. And I realized in that moment that I'd been sleepwalking essentially since the end of the Cold War. So I came home from these interviews, as you mentioned, Tom, it was at the height of the fire and fury between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. In Hawaii, nuclear tensions were particularly high because we knew that we had been marked on Pyongyang's map of nuclear death. We were actually getting instructions from our government about how to prepare for a nuclear attack and how to survive a nuclear attack. So all of this was present in my awareness on the morning of January 13th, 2018, when I was one of over a million people across the Hawaiian Islands who all got that message on our cell phones, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. And at first it was, is this real? And so we started to try to dial 911. We couldn't get through because everybody was trying to dial 911 all at the same time. It was just busy and busy and busy for everybody. So at that moment, my partner said, well, I don't know if this is real or not, but I'm going to go get the girls. Our younger daughters were uh, seven miles away in the town of Kapa'a. So he was rushing to go out the door. And I said, wait a second, we need a plan if it is real. I don't want to be separated. He said, call me in the car and we'll make a plan. So he left and I stood there and I was dazed. And I thought, who's going to know if this is real or not? And I immediately thought of my friend, Felicia Calden, who's a journalist, a dear friend, and she's the first to know anything on the island and everybody takes her phone call. So I started to try to call her. I left a message. I texted her. I checked her Facebook page, nothing. And after what seemed like an eternity, she called me back and she said, Cynthia, the county is telling us to take shelter. And for me, that was the moment where it was, my God, this is real. I have to take this seriously. So the first question was, where do we go? So we have a neighbor who has a meditation cave on his property, which is the most sealed environment we could think of. So we agreed to shelter together and meet in the cave. And then it was, well, what do I take with me? And I looked at my phone and it had 12% charge. And I thought, oh my God. So I, then I thought, well, I think there's, there are lights in the cave. So maybe there's an outlet. So I grabbed a bag and I threw my phone charger, my computer, my computer charger. And then I grabbed a shawl to wrap around my face in case of radiation and then leggings for the same reason all went into the bag. And then I thought food and water. And I thought I've done nothing to prepare my family for this. We were supposed to have one gallon of water per day for 14 days per person, and also enough canned food for the entire family for 14 days. And I looked on the shelf and I had two small bottles of water. I threw them in the bag and then a bunch of bananas from the shelf. And then it was just, there's no time to walk. I've got it. I've got to drive. I don't know how many minutes I have. So I started to drive off the farm. And then it was only at that moment that I allowed myself to think of my daughter in LA who had just left a few days before. And truly, if I'd thought of her really a second before that, I probably wouldn't have been able to hold it together to organize myself to get out of the house. I tried to call her and it was ringing and ringing and the cell service isn't good. And so I wasn't able to get through and I got to a place to park near the steps to the cave and I jumped out of the car and it was still ringing and ringing. And finally, when I got to the foot of the steps of the cave, she picked up. And I said, Mackenzie, I don't know if you've heard the news, but we've all got this message on our cell phones that we're going to be hit by a ballistic missile and we're going to shelter in the cave. And I just want you to know that I love you. And she said, mom, I love you too. And time stopped for me 
in that next moment because I thought, am I ever going to see her again? Is this the last time I'm ever going to hear her voice? I don't want to let her go. I don't want to hang up. And then I thought, is this not just about her and me? Is this not just about one nuclear missile from North Korea? But is this one of those accidental nuclear wars that Secretary Perry and all the experts told me they were so concerned about? Is this many nuclear missiles coming from Russia to the United States and many from the United States headed back to Russia? Is this going on all over the world? Is this the beginning of the end of the world as we know it? Is this the beginning of the end of everything and everyone we know and love and cherish on this earth? And then I heard, mom, mom, go, go. So Mackenzie jolted me out of this thinking. And I said, I love you. And I ran up the steps to the cave. And just as I got to the door to the cave and I was about to open it, it opened. And it was my neighbor, Colleen, and she was smiling and she said it was a false alarm. So it, it took 38 minutes for our government to get us the message on our cell phones that it was a false alarm. And even with everything that I knew about nuclear weapons and nuclear war and nuclear fallout and Hiroshima and nuclear winter, nuclear war was unimaginable to me until I went through those 38 minutes. And now it it's inside of me. It lives inside of me. It was a gut punch. It was a visceral wake up call. And it's here inside of me and it's never going to leave me until we eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. Thanks, Cynthia. That is a truly harrowing tale. I can't imagine being in that situation. and I'm sure you couldn't either until you actually had to, had to do it. And now looking back three years later, you know, what lessons did you draw from that experience and what have you been doing since to raise more awareness um, about the situation? Well, on, on the nuclear weapons side of things, just obviously the need to eliminate the risk of an accidental nuclear war due to a false alarm. That was just a, an obvious takeaway. And I have to say that before this happened, I had the intellectual understanding of nuclear false alarms. I knew some of the history hearing from Secretary Perry and others speak of the high stakes cases, the nuclear false alarms during the Cold War that happened where we thought there were hundreds of missiles coming our way or the Soviets thought there were hundreds of missiles going their way. And um, we just had a short time to decide whether it was a false alarm or not. And we have just been so lucky. So I knew about that. But after going through those 38 minutes, you know, the idea of human error, of human fallibility, of all the things that could possibly go wrong to create a nuclear false alarm, this came into my life, into my home, into my family, into my cell phone in capital letters. So now that I've lived through a false alarm, I know in my gut that this danger is not going to go away. The risk of some kind of accidental nuclear war due to a false alarm or due to a blunder or a miscalculation or a mistake in the heated moment of conflict, that it's not going to go away until we eliminate nuclear weapons. So the big takeaway was that we have to eliminate nuclear weapons. There's so many lessons, but on the personal side, I want to say, that for me and hundreds of thousands of others of us who went through this and took it seriously, it was a deeply personal near-death experience. We now know that while I was calling my daughter to say I love you and goodbye, hundreds of thousands of other people were doing the same thing. We were all calling our loved ones to say I love you and goodbye. And, and so when you have this experience where you think you're going to die, or you might die, and then suddenly you're still here, there's this feeling of, you know, pinching your cheeks and saying, my God, I'm still here. We're all still here. And, and so everything kind of felt new. Um, I almost really felt like a child. The, everything was enhanced. The sound of the wind, I felt it on my cheeks in a way I'd never felt it before. You know, the the, the sound of the ocean, everything, my, all of my senses, the colors outside my window of 
the purples and the greens and the crown flower bush, the butterflies, I felt like I was looking at the world through the eyes of, of a child. And so there was this deeper appreciation of life um, that we can't take anything for granted, that life is so precious and our loved ones are so dear. And so we have to make sure that somehow we don't live with this nuclear shadow anymore. And, and so then it was this moment of now that we know what this feels like, we have to do something that this is a wake up call that we've been given another chance. And now that we have this chance, we have to do something and we have to get it right this time. And it comes back to the same takeaway. The only way to get it right is to get rid of nuclear weapons. And so the big lesson all the way around was we have to eliminate nuclear weapons. Which of course is a, a tall order. A very tall order, but something that we need to do. It's existential. No, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, and, and tell me how you have been using this second chance, if you will, to bring more attention and focus to the need to eliminate nuclear weapons. So when I got home from the cave, there was this feeling of, you need to share this. You need to write this down and you need to write it down right now while it's fresh, moment to moment, what, what, what this was like. And so I started writing and I started writing also about what I'd learned from the experts and what was going through my head all the nightmare nuclear scenarios, because I didn't know which one it was during those 38 minutes. And I started weaving it into an article that was published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, really as a prayer and as an offering to, to awakening. And as I was writing the article, I thought, I can't leave people in despair and awakening isn't enough. And it's awakening to action. And so action has to go hand in hand with awakening. And so I thought, what can I offer people? And then I thought of all the recommendations made by Secretary Perry, Gorbachev, and all the experts I've in, I'd interviewed for the film and NGOs, like so many NGOs that recommend these things, the steps that we can take to immediately reduce the risk of a nuclear catastrophe and move towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. And I put them together. They're not my steps, but inspired by others into something called a nuclear play, the nuclear playbook which is on a website because I started a nonprofit also called Nuclear Wake Up Call Earth when the article came out. And I want to say one thing about the steps that they include many of the steps that people will be familiar with, like no first use and, and many steps that, that are out there now. But and I also included steps that really have Russia in mind um, because we still have over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And my work through much of my life, starting in the late 70s, has been involved with the former Soviet Union and Russia. And I know that we have to take the lead in eliminating our arsenals if we're going to have a prayer of everyone else doing it. So, so there are things in there that talk about the need to restore and maintain a constant dialogue on nuclear risk and nuclear cooperation and arms control and strategic stability no matter what's going on in relations, that keeping that dialogue open and reaffirming the declaration of President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. These activities are of course impacted by COVID. I haven't been able to travel to Russia for more than a year now, but we work on what we call track two and track 1.5 citizen diplomacy and cultural exchange, looking for all the different ways that we can do things that the governments can't do. We talk with our nuclear security counterparts over there about ways we might try to implement steps of the nuclear playbook, imagine whether that might be possible. We do things, ask the question, what has the capacity to open hearts and minds to really touch people? So we took Hawaii artist and activist Makana on a, an Aloha tour of Russia. He has, he plays extraordinary Hawaiian, native Hawaiian music. He's a master of the um, native Hawaiian tradition of slack key guitar. And he really shares Aloha wherever he goes. So we were there with him in the fall of 2018 on this tour. And we had a concert and discussion on nuclear risk reduction at the same time in the Diplomatic Academy of the Foreign Ministry. And it was 
a week where we were announcing the withdrawal from the INF Treaty. And so the mood when we arrived was very, very solemn, I would say more than solemn. It was really sad and, and people were, were very upset about what was going on. And Makana played his music. And even though the discussions were challenging, we were all brought to a place of common humanity through the music and our hearts were really open. So we work to do things like that. And a project that I'm working on now is bringing together indigenous peoples in the Bering Strait, where there is now an increased risk of conflict due to strategic competition and rivalry because of the melting ice in the Arctic. And there've been a number of military incidents in the air and at sea between the United States and Russia in recent times. So it's a place where we're going to gather indigenous peoples in the center of the Bering Strait, where the border between our two countries is less than three miles apart. They will be doing ceremony, sharing prophecy, um, music, art, dance, culture, and initiating some joint environmental projects that relate to the climate change impacts in the Bering Strait and the common concerns they have about the need for marine conservation. So that's that's some of what I've been working on. That's a lot. Thanks very much. And, and in addition to that, you're also working on a project to foster a new generation of women leaders. Tell us about that. Well, Tom, this one is really near and dear to my heart, and it's the one I'm most excited about, um, especially because it's an online program now, and I can do it during COVID with people all over the world. And, you know, and always asking the question that I come back to over and over again is, what has the capacity to break through in these times that where there's so many challenges and especially now that we're facing the existential threat of the pandemic. And of course we have the existential threat of climate change and so many just day-to-day concerns right now for people going through this pandemic. What has the capacity to break through? What has the capacity to be game-changing? And in asking that question, the answer came to me Um, when four young women, none of whom knew each other and none of whom had ever done anything related to nuclear weapons before, all came to me within the space of about a week. And they had all been touched by the story of the Hawaii false alarm and calling my daughter to say goodbye. And they all asked me the same question. They all said, will you mentor me? Can I have a voice in this work? And so that's how the project of Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy was born. They planted the seeds for it. They asked for it. We are setting out to foster a new generation of women leaders in peace building and disarmament. And we're working to catalyze a global movement of women and girls to eliminate nuclear weapons. We recognize the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls due to ionizing radiation. And that since the dawn of the nuclear age, women have been largely shut out of national security planning and nuclear policy making. And that excluding half of the human race for much of the nuclear age has brought us to the brink of possible extinction. Because the research shows that when women are involved, peace agreements become more possible and peace agreements more enduring. And so we recognize that today, especially during this pandemic, more than ever, that it's an existential imperative that women come forward to lead, to claim their seat at the table and eliminate nuclear weapons. And so I just wanna say that a driving principle here is another existential imperative, which is the need to democratize nuclear policy. That if nuclear weapons can destroy all of us, we all have a seat to claim at the table to eliminate them. And this is what I said to young Mahina, one of the four young women who came to me with tears in her eyes and said, do you really think that I could have a voice on this project? And I said, all of our lives are at stake. You know, we can't leave this up to the experts. If they can destroy all of us, we all have a seat to claim at this table. So we can claim our seats to eliminate them. So that's the background. What we have is an online global mentoring program. We had our inaugural session last fall on the United Nations Day for the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And we have since 
engaged over 300 women from 42 countries, including eight of the nine nuclear armed states. And I have to just say that I am so grateful to the Plowshares Fund Women's Initiative because they've made the launching of this program possible. So deep bows of gratitude because I wouldn't be here having this conversation about this project without Plowshares. We've had four sessions thus far, and I just want to say that we have brilliant mentors from across the spectrum of the nuclear space who come into the sessions. They don't always have the same approach. I kind of like to mix up different people with different approaches, and we engage them in a dialogue, questions related to transforming our nuclear legacy across again, a range of subject matter, a range of themes. And we, we honor and celebrate the work of the mentors and they're really, really imparting their experience and their knowledge and their wisdom and their insights into the women and girls gathered from around the world. They build nuclear literacy. They, they often talk about intersectionality, connecting this, making it personal, connecting this to issues in people's lives, the pandemic, climate, um, the disproportionate impact on women and girls, systemic racism, et cetera, et cetera. And the mentors nurture, nourish one another and they're nourished in this space, which is really exciting. It, we, 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 we start the sessions differently than you would normally start a session about nuclear issues. We start the session with an indigenous elder here on Kauai, Kumuhula Puna Dawson, sharing a blessing and offering a blessing, which creates a safe space for conversations to take place where everybody can be heard and everybody can be honored for what they have to say. So, and we, and, and the mentors invite all the people gathered to collaborate with them. So there's a collaboration piece that comes with it so that it's action oriented, awakening to action. So the last thing I wanna say about the project is that in our inaugural session, we were honored to have with us Ambassador Elaine White Gomez, who negotiated the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons at the United Nations. And she was so inspiring, but she said, coming back to this need for democratization of the nuclear space, that history is made by every single step that we take every day. And that it's up to all of us that we're all in this together. And she invited all of us as women to come together and join her and the company of men to work toward eliminating nuclear weapons. So I would say, may it be so. May it be so. Um, thanks for that. And uh, one last question for you, Cynthia. Uh, you were lucky enough to know Sally Lilienthal, who of course was the founder of Plowshares and, uh, and was a force of nature, <laughs> as anyone who knows her knows. Um, I'm wondering if you have any um, stories you'd like to tell about, uh, about Sally. I was honored to be a Plowshares grantee in the 1980s. And she would do things like call me up late at night. And one night she called me up and said, you need to be able to answer this question. What would you do if you were given a million dollars? What would you do with that? And so I started to say, well, I think I would do, she said, no, you need to tell me exactly what you would do. And so in that way, she was always setting the bar really high and she was never daunted by the task. And she still inspires me to this day. I mean, I miss her now more than ever. And one other thing I will say is that after the Cold War ended, I was still doing some things related to this work, but I basically went to work on coral reefs and climate change. And she used to scold me every time we met and said, what are you doing? And I would say, but the Cold War's over. And she said, but we still have this threat. And so I wish she were still here today. I miss her now more than ever because I would love to be able to say, guess what? <laughs> Bill Perry woke me up. I'm back. And, um, and so I understand her birthday's coming up soon. So I just want to say wherever you are, Sally, happy birthday and blessings and so much gratitude to you. We wouldn't be here without you. Thanks, Cynthia. And uh, as usual, uh, Sally was right <laughs> about the Cold War being over, but the risk uh, not going away. Cynthia, it was uh, such a pleasure to have you here today. Unfortunately, we are out of time, uh, but I want to wish you the best with your work. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Tom. We 
And now, a question from one of our listeners. Tom, are you ready for this? Bring it on, Michelle. This week's question comes from Tyler in Sarasota. Tyler asks, During the recent SolarWinds cyber attack, did the hackers access any software or systems connected to nuclear command and control? What actions have been taken in response to the hack to protect the nuclear infrastructure? Thanks, Michelle. And Tyler, thanks for your question. I don't think any new information has come out about any sensitive classified information about nuclear command and control that was revealed or shared as a result of the solar winds cyber attack. Nor do we know what the responses have been other than the Biden administration made clear when it announced the extension of the New START Treaty that they would be uh, responding in some way to Solar Winds cyber attack, which intelligence tells us was originated by Russia. So we're still waiting to see uh, what that might be. I would just say in terms of, of how the United States responds to cyber attacks like this in the future, which we expect will become more frequent, cyber defenses are, are one answer to this. But they can't be the only answer. People in the realm of, of cybersecurity will tell you that cyber defenses are not going to keep up um, with evolving and accelerating cyber offenses. It's very difficult in the space for defenses to keep ahead of offenses. And so, in particularly in the nuclear policy realm, we're going to have to change policy, uh, nuclear use control policy, uh, not just cyber policy. And essentially what that means is that the frequency uh, and severity of cyber attacks increases. Presidents cannot assume that the information they're getting from our early warning systems uh, are accurate. For example, if a president receives a warning uh, that there's a nuclear attack coming in, that could be a false alarm, that could be the result of a hack or bad information. And so presidents simply can't assume that information is correct until they see the proof on the ground. So presidents should not respond uh, to alerts of an attack Presidents, if they get uh, a report of a nuclear attack, need more time, not less, to decide on that. They should not be responding to alerts until they know whether the attack is real or false. Certainly, the last thing we want to do is have a president start nuclear war by mistake in response to a false alarm. So as we go towards the future, we need to be thinking about changing U.S. nuclear policy in the face of increasing risks of cyber attacks to reduce the chances of starting a nuclear war by mistake. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tyler. And thank you, Tom. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Will Lowry, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.